You were listening to the Victory Podcast. We hope this message will encourage you. Registration for EN 2010 is still ongoing. Sign up now while you still can. Don't miss this rare opportunity to come together with our Every Nation family from all over the world. For more details, visit www.en2010.com. Now, here's your message. Join me in welcoming Dr. Harold Sela. <laughs> Maramin Salamat Po. I am indeed touched by those gracious words, especially about your wife. In 1974, we packed 25 barrels and seven crates and took our three children and we came here. Our hearts have been here ever since. Bishop Fred McBanwa often introduces me as an American with a Filipino heart. And I love that. Because, honestly, I was born in the United States, but long ago I ceased to think of myself as an American. I am simply God's ambassador. And I am here today as your brother, your friend, and in some cases, your Lolo. (laughs) On one occasion, I asked the pastor just before I start, how long can I preach? He said, well, you can preach as long as you want, but our people go home at 12 o'clock. And I am fully aware that it is 20 minutes till 12, and I promise you that I shall stop by 12 o'clock Bangkok time. (laughs) In just a moment, we're going to open the word. But as I heard the pastor this morning talk about the tithe belongs to the Lord, I had to think of an experience that I shall never forget. We flew up to Boonhin or Boontigi in the northern part of Luzon. I'd gone in with a medical team, and Sil had translated God's word into the language of the people. Now, there was no formal church, but there was a place where people would come and they would meet together. So, at the end of the day, they came from the rice terraces and wherever they had been, and they assembled together to hear me speak. Well, it was a long evening because I spoke in English and it was translated into Ilocano and Ifugao. So it took three times as long anyway to get it across as it normally would. So then about 10 or 11 o'clock, we started taking questions from the people. I shall never forget one man who was sitting over here, and there was interaction between the translator and this person who was sitting there, and he said, he's got a question. Sure. What is his question? His question is, why should we who have so little give to God who has so much. I took a look at this man. He's sitting there on his haunches, and he's been there for several hours. He's wearing a G-string and a t-shirt that was ragged and sweaty and old. None of us would be caught dead in that thing. And yet he's asking, why should we who have so little give to God who has so much? This guy had been thinking. I had said nothing about money. So I paused for a minute and I said, there are three reasons. First of all, you should give because God tells us to. Simple obedience. I said the second reason you should give is because you can pool your money and then you can send an evangelist over the mountain and you can tell someone in the next valley or area about Jesus Christ. And then I said, this should not be your motive, but it is a means of God pouring out his blessing in your life. On December 23... Darlene and I were married for 50 years. From the day we got married to the present, we have not only tithed, but we have tried to give many times more than the tithe. Have we lacked anything? Absolutely not. Sometime I'd like to tell you how God will bless you when you honor his word in simple obedience. You can't outgive the Lord. This great God who loves us so much that he sent his son delights in blessing his children. This morning while we're together, I want to talk with you about your relationship with Jesus Christ. This is known as Palm Sunday by Christendom. And I would direct your attention to the scripture that we find in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. Here is what it says. The crowds that went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, 
Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Christendom calls this the triumphal entry. Jesus had been in Bethany and he made his way to Jerusalem. Before he entered the city, he straddled a donkey, fulfilling a promise that was made 500 years before that the Messiah, the deliverer, would come riding humbly on the back of a donkey. And as soon as they came through the gate, probably the eastern gate of the city, then people took off their garments and threw them on the ground. They cut palm branches or branches of trees and put them there so that Jesus could ride over these. Why did they do that? They did that because it was a custom. When somebody had conquered a city, they came in triumphantly and took, people took off their garments. It was a sign of submission, laid them down, and they rode across them. And the people shout, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know what Hosanna meant? Hosanna meant, save us now. They expected Jesus Christ to march into Jerusalem because the crowd was behind him, people power in the streets, and throw the Romans out and establish Jewish government. When they cried, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, they thought salvation would come in relationship to the Romans, not in relationship to God. What does it really mean to embrace him as the son of David, as Lord? To fully understand what lordship is all about, we go back to the Old Testament. The Hebrew word was Adon, or Adonai, and it was used two ways. First of all, it was used as a title where you would address someone as sir. The Bible tells us that Sarah addressed Abraham as Lord. Now, men, don't expect your wives to do this. That's just pushing it too far. But it was a term of respect. In fact, every, every New Testament book has the same thing with the exception of Titus and the epistles of John. So in the New Testament, however, the tradition was carried forward. So the word Adon was in the Old Testament. It was kurios in the New Testament. It is, first of all, a term of respect, and then it is a term relating to God. To understand what Jesus really is and who he is, we need to understand something of what it's all about. Early in the ministry of Jesus, it became apparent that when people addressed him as Lord or kurios, they were not calling him sir or mister. They were calling him Lord. And that is what really riled the Philistines. So the question that confronts us today, was Jesus really God? Was he the unique fusion of man and God in one, indivisible yet complete? Well, it is certain that Jesus claimed to be God. In John chapter 8, we find a conversation that took place between Jesus and the Pharisees. And the Pharisees accused him of doing his miracles in the power of Satan. And Jesus refuted that very clearly. In this conversation, he said, Abraham saw my day far off and he rejoiced to see it. But you are blind and you do not recognize this. And then he said something really powerful. It's hard to understand how powerful it is in our context of English or Tagalog or whatever today. He said, before Abraham was, I Am. Well, that's kind of open in. I am what? Okay, let's go backwards. Do you remember when God called Moses and said, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And Moses said, look, I've been on the backside of the desert for 40 years. I mean, I, my tongue gets tied. I don't know what I will say. So if I go into the palace of Pharaoh, what will I say? Who will I tell them sent me? God said, tell them, I am hath sent you. I am what? I am the totality of existence. And so when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, it directly relates to what God told Moses, and they knew that he was saying, I am God. And that's when the sparks really begin to flow, fly. A few years ago, I was on an airplane, <laughs> And sitting next to me was a young man who was a real rebel. It was obvious from his deportment and his appearance. 
First of all, he had a wild head of hair. We used to call them afros. Now, I wish, frankly, mine were a little more wild than it is. When I moved here in 1974, I had black wavy hair. I really did. But eventually, the hair on this side waved to the hair on this side and said, goodbye, <laughs> goodbye. But the young man who was sitting next to me that day had not taken a bath for a long time. And as soon as he sat down, my nose began to wiggle. Okay. I buckled my seatbelt, and I reached in my briefcase, and I got out a commentary on the book of Revelation. I was doing a study. So I am sitting on the aisle. The young man is sitting next to me. And as I start to read, he leans over, and he begins reading along with me. I thought, we're going to talk about this before we get off this plane. So finally, he points to it, and he says, what are you reading? I was ready. I said, it is a commentary on the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the last book in the New Testament, 2,000 years old. But it tells us what's happening in the world and what's going to happen in the future. And then I turned to him and said, got a question for you. In your opinion, who is Jesus Christ? He hadn't expected that. He thought for a minute and he said, well, I think he was a good man, you know. Buddha, Jesus, Mohammed. He said, they're all good. And to his surprise, I responded, I don't think so. I don't agree. I said, I'll tell you why. Jesus claimed to be God. If he was God, he was more than good. If he claimed to be God and he was not and he knew that he wasn't, he was a deceiver and he misled people. That's the issue that C.S. Lewis, the, Oxford, or the Cambridge University professor, addressed when he said simply, either he was a raving lunatic of an unusually abominable type or else he was and is the very son of God. And then he said, don't come up with any of that nonsense about his being a good man. He hasn't left that course open to us. Jesus claimed to be God. It was just that simple. Those who encountered Jesus also believed that he was God. Take, for example, the man who was born blind. You read about him in John chapter 8, immediately following the conversation with the Pharisees. He came to Jesus, and Jesus spat on the ground and mixed it up with the dust and the dirt and put it in the man's eye. Why did he do that? Well, we don't know for certain, but I have always felt that perhaps the man was born without an eye, and Jesus completed the work of creation. You know, Jesus brings healing to our lives, to our bodies, to our troubled relationships, and then Jesus said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. I stood on this very spot a few weeks ago. I thought of this event. And he goes and he takes the water and he puts it in his face. And he can see. He can see. I have talked to doctors who told me how that they had done surgery and somebody could see for the first time. What a thrill. So they grab this guy and they say, okay, you need to talk to the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of the day. So... The Pharisees confront him, and they want to know what happened. Well, I'll just put it in my own language. He tells them, look, I was blind, but now I can see. So then they turn to the parents, and they say, look, uh, was your son really born blind? And they say, he is of age, ask him. So they pass the ball back across the net into the court of the son, and they begin to interrogate him. They say, he is a sinner. How can he in turn bring healing to you? And finally, he said, look, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. There's one thing I do know. I used to be blind, but now I can see. That is the acid proof. Later, Jesus confronted the man, and he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he cried out, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. You worship only God. And what about the disciples? Did they in turn believe that Jesus was God? Before Jesus was born, an angel appeared to Joseph, and the angel told him, you shall call his name Jesus, Yasha. It means to save or deliver, because he shall save his people from their sin. The name of Jesus is a beautiful name. It is an awesome name. But there is not one record that the disciples ever called him Jesus. 
I mean, other people did, but not the disciples. They called him Lord. For three years, they walked with Jesus. They saw him heal the sick, made blind people to see, even raised the dead on three occasions. Thomas spoke for them all when he cried out, My Lord and my God. From that hour on, when men called Jesus Lord, they were referring to him as God. First century Christians also believed that he was God, and they were willing to pay the price for that. Toward the end of the first century, Domitian, who was a Roman emperor, passed a law stating that every person should go to a pagan temple, take a pinch of incense, and then offer it to himself. And they had to say, Caesar est in curios. Caesar is curios or Lord. Got it? Christians, however, said, Christos est in curios. Christ is Lord. And they refused to bow the knee to a pagan dictator. All people said, look, why don't you just satisfy Rome? The way to get along is to go along. You don't have to believe it. Just take that little pinch of incense and say, Caesar est in curios, you know, Caesar is Lord. They refused to do it. And many died for their faith because they believed he was God. We fast forward to the 21st century. We are living in an exciting world, world of space exploration, world of technology, miracle medicines, a host of things that even a previous generation didn't have. What does it really mean to acknowledge the Lordship of Christ today? I will give you six or seven items. First of all, it means that you acknowledge his position as the Son of God. It is right here that Christianity rises or falls. Passion Week is upon us. And we celebrate the fact that he was crucified between two thieves, dead, placed in a tomb, but three days later, death could not keep him. He rose literally from the dead. And friend, that is the one thing that separates Christianity from all the religions of the world. It is just that simple. Now, Jesus is Lord, not because I say so. He is Lord because God brought him forth from the dead and demonstrated that he is Lord. I do not believe that anyone can carefully and critically examine the evidence without coming to the conclusion, this was no mortal man. This had to be God's son. Lee Strobel, who is the author of the book, The Case for Christ, was an atheist. He was an investigative reporter for a Chicago newspaper when his wife became a Christian. And when his wife became a Christian, Lee didn't like it. In fact, they almost divorced. You know why? He thought, she's not going to be any fun anymore. She'll probably sit around, wear black and drink vinegar. She probably won't dance with me or drink with me or, you know, just have fun with me. But this guy saw something in her life. She began to change. And the change in her life really impressed him. So he decided that he would do an impartial investigation just like he was investigating a crime. It took him two years to do this. And at the end of that two-year period, he bowed his knee and he confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. One of the tragedies of our day is the number of people who say, I don't want to go to hell, so I will accept Jesus as my Savior. Their lives do not change. Listen, you cannot separate what Jesus did from who he is. The second thing that it means to acknowledge Jesus as Lord is that you embrace his lordship and you let him ascend the throne of your heart. One of these days in the British Isles, there's going to be a new monarch. Elizabeth Regina has been queen, but she's getting on up into years. And the fact that she is queen does not defer from her humanity. She will only live so long. And in all probability, her son, who is Prince Charles, will become the king or possibly his son. And when that time comes, the great men of the kingdom will assemble in Westminster Abbey. That's the way they do it there. There will be lords and ladies, and there will be royalty from Europe, and there will be VIPs. And the Archbishop of Canterbury will perform a ceremony. And he will turn to the people who are assembled in that great cathedral, and he will say, Sires, I present to you Prince Charles, your rightful king. Are you willing to, are you ready to pay homage? 
And there will be a thunderous affirmation as people applaud and clap. And then he will advance before the kneeling prince. And he will take the crown and place on his head. And Prince Charles will become king. Philippians chapter 2 tells us, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That is in the future. But there is an empty place in your heart. And you have to determine whether ego sets on the throne, or you invite Jesus Christ come in, and you crown him as your Lord and as your King. Have you done that? That's the beginning of what it means to walk with him. To acknowledge Christ as your Lord brings spontaneous worship, worship and praise. On a certain occasion, King George V was at one of his hunting lodges. And as he walked into the dining room, there were others who were seated there, and immediately they rose to their feet. And the king turned to them and they said, Sires, I am not your Lord. And one of them replied, we know that you are not our Lord, because if you were our Lord, we would not rise to our feet. We would fall on our knees before you. Ah, they knew the difference. So to recognize Christ as Lord means that you submit to his authority and you walk in simple obedience to what God wants. You know, for years, there has been that battle between humble submission and arrogant independence. You know, we have an illusion that we are really in control. The reality is there are so many things that happen in life that we can't really control, but he can control. And subsequently, there are two powerful emotions that we have to confront. One is love. The other is fear. Now, if I were, let's say I went to some activity and I had to park my car a certain distance from where the activity took place and I'm walking back and it's late at night and somebody turns the corner and they get out a gun. Give me your money. You know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to growl with the guy. I'll say, look, I'm a poor preacher, but here's my money. And the guy may say, yeah, I know you're a poor preacher. I've heard you preach before. But he will take my money and run. Okay, now, when my wife asks me for my money, I don't argue with her. I say, sure, honey, you're going to Mega Mall. Here's my money. Buy anything you want. Well, maybe not. Yeah, I really do. I do say that thing, don't I, honey? Okay, what is the difference? You fear the guy. You fear the guy on the one hand, but you love the person on the other. And subsequently, when you really love Jesus, you learn you can trust him. But a lot of people are afraid to really lay it on the line with him and let him take over. Diogenes was a Greek philosopher. And on a certain occasion, a man came to him and said, Diogenes, I want to be your disciple. So Diogenes said, all right, here are two fish. Carry the fish in your tunic for two weeks and then come back and follow me. So the man took the two fish and he tucked them into his tunic in three hours, cats were following him. In three days, his wife booted him out of the house and he was sleeping in the alley. In seven days, he came back and he threw the fish at the feet of the philosopher and said, it is too much, I just cannot do it. Diogenes looked at him and said, such great commitment and all lost over two smelly fish. There are some individuals think that if they really follow Christ, they will not succeed in business. They will no longer laugh. They will never have fun. They will lose all of their friends. And all of this is totally incorrect. To know Jesus is to love him. And to love him is to obey him. And to obey him is to walk with him. It is just that simple. To know Christ means you will find that he loves you and you respond to his love. And then it becomes easy to obey him. And it becomes joyful to worship him. And then finally, you discover his will is better than yours. Romans chapter 14 says, We are not our own bosses to live or die as we ourselves might choose. Living or dying, we follow the Lord. Either way, we are his. By right of redemption, I am his. But if he would be my Lord, I must be willing to bow to him. A few thoughts about obedience quickly. First of all, obedience is entirely voluntary. You see, he does not force you to obey him. 
It's your decision. Secondly, it is necessary to please him, or obedience is pleasing to our Heavenly Father. And it's really necessary if you're going to do what he wants you to do. Jesus chided the disciples, and he told them, Why do you call me Lord, and do not the things that I command you? And you can hear the echo of that refrain in life today. And then, obedience needs to be continual, day after day. And finally, obedience needs to be complete. He wants everything you have. And it is his desire to be Lord of all of your life, your thought life, your possessions, your time. Now, for just a moment, suppose that you should buy a house. Let's say you heard about a house that is available in your area, and it's a nice house. And so the price is right, and you are ready to sign the contract to make the purchase. But the owner of the house says, look, look. There's an attic up here, just a small room, and I have some things there that are very private. And I cannot give you, I cannot give you access to the attic. You can have access to all of the rest of the house, not the attic. That's mine. You would look at him and say, are you crazy? I mean, you want to sell your house, but you want to be able to access the attic? I want the whole thing. There are some individuals who will bow the knee in submission, but they say, you can't access this part of my life. It may be a relationship. It may be a habit. It may be something that you're involved with and your wife doesn't know about it or your husband doesn't know about it and neighbors and friends don't know about it, but I got news for you, God does. And our Lord Jesus Christ wants to take possession of the whole thing. So embracing the Lord Jesus, Lordship of Jesus Christ means simply put that I let him take complete control and I submit my will to his will. God's will begins afresh every morning. It may have been that you heard God's call back a number of years ago, and you missed it in your downstream. I meet people all of the time, all over the world, who say, when I was young, God called me to do something, and I didn't do it, and I have lived with this brokenness all my life. Hey, listen, friend, maybe you missed a turn in the road down there, but today... God has a new will for your life, and he will show you what he wants you to do. I was on my way to a church service, and uh, I had a mug of coffee sitting uh, next to, uh, on the little console where the transmission is. I had a little pickup truck then. And all of a sudden, I noticed there's something warm in my shoe. And I looked down, and I've knocked over the mug of coffee. Oh, I'm not quite so happy then. But I reach under the, the seat, and I get an old rag, and I'm starting to mop up the coffee as best I could. And then I look up, and I realize I missed my turn on the freeway. I jam on the brakes. And then I think, hey, dummy, you can't back up on a freeway, at least in California, and you can't do the same thing here. If you miss your turn, what do you do? And then I say, okay, how do I get to where I want to go from where I am now? Look, don't look behind you. Simply look ahead of you. Sharks only go one direction. They do not back up. Alligators or crocodiles have to stop and turn to the left or right before they take off again. Well, I don't care whether you turn to the left or the right, but just go where God wants you to go. May I share with you something that has been helpful to me for many years? God's will is like a flashlight in a dungeon. It doesn't shine around corners. It doesn't illuminate the next cave. It just gives you enough light for the next step. And when you take that step, God will show you what the next one is. Listen, he has not given us the burden of understanding, only the yoke of obedience. In Romans chapter 12, we are told that God's will is good, acceptable, and complete. Good. It is intrinsically good. Acceptable. Acceptable to our Heavenly Father, and when you understand where he is leading you, you realize his will is so much better than yours. And then finally, it is complete. The word that is used in the King James is perfect. But I think of it as complete in the sense that he knows the end from the beginning and I can trust him and follow him. Embracing his lordship means that I recognize everything I have belongs to him. And that relieves me of a great responsibility. Many of you know the name Dr. Bill Bright, who established Campus Crusade, right? 
When God began to speak to Bill and Yvonne about serving him, he drew up a legal document, and he and his wife bequeathed everything they had to Jesus Christ. Wow, did he really do that? Yeah, he did. What do you have that God wants to control? Well, first of all, you have time. You know, there are many inequities, things that are unfair in life. But when it comes to time, everybody is absolutely equal. You have 168 hours in every week. Now, when it comes to talents, they are diverse. We have in this auditorium all kinds of people who have all kinds of talent. We have an amazing breadth of talent and education and resources and so forth. And then we have treasures. Some of us have very little. Some of us have a great deal. It matters not. But what does matter is are you willing to say, Lord Jesus, I am yours along with everything that you have given to me. And what you have given to me is a stewardship. I will use it wisely for your kingdom. That's what God wants. To acknowledge Jesus as your Lord means that you recognize eventually we're going to win. Victors because of Christ. There's a little comic strip character called Ziggy. Used to be in the papers here. Haven't seen it for a long time. But one that I really like is Ziggy is standing looking up to heaven. And he says, when does win a few begin? Win a few. Do you ever feel like that? Do you get battered by life? Deals go bad. People betray you. People disappoint you. And it seems like you get clobbered every time you turn around. Read the last chapter, friend. Revelation chapter 22. When he comes riding back and he establishes his kingdom, he says, behold, I come quickly. One of these days, we're going to be on the winning team for sure. When I was a kid, I discovered a Western author whose name was Zane Gray. Now, Wayne Zay, uh, <laughs> he was not very politically correct, and he has fallen into disfavor today. But, you know, he was kind of the forerunner of a guy whose name was Louis L'Amour, who has written hundreds of thousands, who has sold thousands, I think millions of books. Wish I could write one that would do that someday. <laughs> but at any length, I remember when I was a kid, I would bring this book home from the library, and I would be reading in bed. And my mother would walk in and she would say, son, lights out, time to go to sleep. Being a dutiful son, I would say, yes, mother, and turn out the light and find my Rayovac flashlight and go under the cover. There used to be these old silver flashlights with two big uh, batteries, you know, called Rayovac. Some of you never heard of it. But at any link, I would go under the cover and I would turn to the last chapter. And I would read the last chapter of the book. I mean, I didn't have to. I knew how it would end. You got three characters. You got the villain, you got the hero, and you got the beautiful damsel. And in the end, the villain gets it because the hero goes in and punches him out. And he sweeps up the beautiful damsel in his arms and they ride into the sunset. They all end the same way. But when I read the last chapter, instead of riding into the sunset... The prince, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes back and establishes his kingdom. Jesus is my Lord. Is he your Lord? In closing, I want to share a story involving what happened in our home when we were living here. We first got here and we had one girl who helped us. And she was lonely so we got a second girl who helped us. And then we have a friend who has no way to go. Can't she come stay with us too? Then we have three girls to help us. But on a certain occasion, one of the girls said, there was a man in our room last night. And at first, I'm kind of red alert. Did the back door get left open? Did one of the girls have someone who came into their little cubicle where they were sleeping? Who is this person? And then I begin to realize they are not talking about a physical male. They are talking about a spirit who appeared as a male. And then we were told that he wants to court this young lady. 
this is pretty serious business. Now, at that point, Marilyn had never really embraced Christ as her Lord and Savior. So I took a living Bible, and I went through it with her, and I marked passages like John 3.16, God so loved the world, he gave his son. Romans 10.9, Romans 10.13, whoever believes on the Lord will be saved. I went through the whole routine, and I remember I said, Marilyn, I want you to pray to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. But she would not, we just couldn't get any response. That night at 10 o'clock, her fever shot up, and we came in to give her aspirin, and she would take them and throw them against the wall. This was totally out of character with this young lady. She had been gentle and gracious and kind. And now with a high fever, she is really violent. Three nights, this spirit came. And then the second night, he said, I am coming back at 10 o'clock and I want your answer. In the meanwhile, I'm wondering what I should do. I call a Filipino evangelist whose name was Jimmy Prieto and I said, Jimmy, here is what has taken place. And I told him, he said, Harold, Marilyn needs to cooperate and she needs to resist the spirit. The next afternoon, I sat down and said, Marilyn, we are at the crossroads. You either embrace Jesus Christ and you proclaim him as your Lord, or else the spirit will take control of your life. Which is it to be? And then I said, I will say the words. I want you to say them after me. Jesus is my Lord. And she sobbed those words out. Jesus is my Lord. And like that, it was gone. She told us later that when I was talking to her, the spirit loomed behind me with horrible, hideous face. And she said, even my face at first was contorted and looked, looked so strange. And then she was free. I commanded the spirit to leave her and to never come back. Jesus is my Lord. Do you realize that at the name of Jesus, demons tremble and they must yield to his power? And Jesus said, all authority is given to you on heaven and earth. Exercise the authority you have in Jesus' name. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. You will be saved. Is Jesus your Lord? Right now, I'm going to ask everyone here to say the words out loud with me, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Together, will you do it? Jesus Christ is my Lord. Say it loud enough that a couple of demons outside will hear you. Together, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Wow. Here's my question. Is this the first time you've ever said that? If so, could I see your hand just high enough so I'll know who you are? First time you've ever said that. Never said that before. Ah, uh, yeah, I can see. There are some. You know what happens when you say that? You get on the same page with all of God's children. Scripture says, as many as receive him. To them he gives authority to become his children, even to those who believe on his name. Not because you're good, but because Jesus died for you. It is just that simple. I'm going to pray for you right now. And in just a few minutes, we wrap this whole thing up. But if you have never established a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's the beginning of the Christian life. And I would encourage you to see one of the pastors, to see one of the elders, some of the counselors, and just say, I'd like to know more about Jesus Christ and what it means to live a victorious life. I have to tell you, I love, I love the name of your fellowship, Victory. There's victory in Jesus Christ. Not in psychology, not in world government, not in the affairs, but there is in Jesus. We're victors. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you that Jesus is exalted in this fellowship. We embrace him as our Savior, but we embrace him totally as our Lord. And so we thank you for what you're doing here. Continue to work in our lives, we pray, that our neighbors and friends will recognize we are different. And that difference is the abiding presence of Jesus. So thank you, Lord. We've been in your presence today, and we have felt your presence, and we glorify and worship your name. In Jesus' strong and wonderful name, and all of God's children said, 
Amen.